I'd like us to turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 11 this morning. We want to bring a message titled, If the Foundations Be Destroyed, What Can the Righteous Do? And that's a question that we find in this psalm, and it's couched within a nest of psalms that uh, David is dealing with his enemies. Uh, if you read through the psalms, you find uh, that theme repeated over and over. David had enemies. And sometimes the enemies caused him to really turn to God and ask for grace. And so we come to Psalm 11, and we find that he is in a situation, and it is believed that at this particular time in David's life and in David's career, uh, he is still not yet king, uh, but Saul is king. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting interplay uh, in this. Uh, here you have Saul, who is running things, and yet David is the anointed king. He was anointed by Samuel to be king, but he's not ruling yet. He's anointed, but he's not ruling. Instead, another is ruling, and he's a madman. And so the things are rough. And so David is trying to live in that situation to be a good soldier and to be a loyal subject and to be a righteous man of God while a madman is running the country. Uh, and so he has advisors. And, and as we look into the psalm, that setting kind of uh, helps us understand what is going on here because he has some people who are giving him advice and then he's responding to this advice. And so the themes in this account are very interesting, and we want to, first of all, be sure to interpret it properly and then apply it uh, just as profitably uh, so that we understand it. And there are a couple of places here where we could go one way or the other with the interpretation, but here's what I've found. Either way, it still works. So I'm not worked up about it. Uh, I've heard others uh, uh, say that, well, you've got to be sure to go with this route or that route. In this case, uh, the main truths of it uh, come out either way. So look at, let's read it together. Psalm chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous, the Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Dear Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand this psalm as part of our inspired scripture. You gave it to us to edify us and speak to our souls. Lord, may we learn from it today. In Jesus' name, amen. In our text, we find David being advised and even coaxed to flee from those who were plotting against him. They said, flee to, not the mountain, but flee to your mountain. Uh, go to a place where you're at home. Go to a place where you know where you are. Uh, David grew up among the hills of Judea, and perhaps there was a place there where he knew they were good hiding places. Now, one thing about the Holy Land, it's similar to uh, some topography, where if you're going to play hide and seek, you've got to go somewhere besides the plains. Uh, as I was riding through Kansas, which, uh, you know, it seems like it takes three days to get through Kansas. If you're on I-70, you just go into, you know, sensory deprivation because you're just, on, yeah, yeah, Kansas, still Kansas, more Kansas. And so you're going through Kansas, right? And it occurred to me, if you're a kid living in Kansas, where do you play hide and seek? I mean, you, you've got to have a cave, you've got to have a, a forest, you've got to have a swamp, you've got to have something, but you know, it's miles of wheat, miles of plains, and you, say, you just have to lay down and cover yourself with a blanket to, to play hide and seek. Well, over there in, the, in Israel, if you want to hide, you have to go to the mountains because that's where the forests are. So they're, they're saying, David, get away, hide, flee to your mountain. And so that's what's going on. Now, the question that David asks when this is going on, and I believe this is a question that David is asking, although uh, some, as we said, interpretively believe that the people who are talking to him are still talking and that they're the ones who brought this out. So let's look at it uh, both ways, okay? If this is David, 
what we have here is they, they are saying what they say, and it ends with the word mountain, okay? Uh, they say, uh, uh, I, how say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? And that's what they say. And now David begins to talk, and he says, for lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their bow. So he's explaining why they said that. But then there are some who say because there's no punctuation in the Hebrew and because there's no quotation marks, it could be that what they are saying is you should flee to your mountain for the wicked are doing this. And they said, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Implying, uh, well, you just got to run. Now, I asked myself, well, which is it? Which is it? Now, I personally think that their question ended with the word mountain and the rest of this is David talking. But I thought, well, what if I'm mistaken and what if it's the other one? You know, sometimes exegetes have to deal with things like that. And so what I came to is, listen, the answer is the same. The answer is the same. It doesn't matter who's asking that question. The, the whole point is, what is the answer to the question? And whether it was the people who were uh, trying to get David to flee, or whether it was David thinking about what they were saying, the question is the question, and the answer is the answer. So let's focus on that. And the question that is asked is, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The themes that are presented here have great meaning to us today because what we see is the foundations of society around us are crumbling. What we see is a degenerating culture, a degenerating society. And when you think about here is David, who is the anointed king of Israel, anointed with oil by a Holy Spirit filled prophet of God, destined to rule in Israel. And yet, at this present time, Israel is being ruled by a madman, one who is not following God, one who is uh, completely off in his mind and filled with envy and hatred and jealousy. Uh, and you, t you take the uh, analogy, if you will, or, or you see this as a metaphor, Christ is the anointed king of the earth, the rightful king of the earth, the one who will come and set up an eternal kingdom, but who's running it right now? the demented deity called Satan. You say, wait a minute. No, listen. Satan is referred to in Scripture as the God of this world. He is also referred to as the prince of the power of the air, the one that rules in the hearts of the children of disobedience. And you remember when Jesus was tempted and how Satan took him to a place and, and he said, okay, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you the kingdoms of the world, for they are given unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I can give them. And Jesus did not argue with him about that point. So here we have an analogy. Here we have a type and an antitype. David, the rightful king, the anointed king, the one who will rule, is not yet ruling, but he is subject, he is under the rule of a madman. So it is in the world today. Those who follow Christ are destined to rule with him a thousand years, but not yet. Right now, we're in a situation where we're dealing with a world gone mad. And so the analogies are rich, and the applications, I believe, will be meaningful as we see them. And so the, the question, if the foundations be destroyed... now. Uh, I don't know how many here own their own homes, but uh, you live in a home. And if you understood, uh, for instance, that underneath your house, the foundations were crumbling and that any time your house could collapse, you would be more concerned with that reality than which pictures to hang on the wall or what color to paint the living room. That would be something you would be thinking about. Uh, uh, you, you, to ignore that problem... Uh, while you deal with other things would, would be uh, uh, kind of ridiculous. And yet uh, many people don't think about it, uh, but the foundations are the most important thing that there is. Uh, if your foundation is good, then the rest will be sound. If the foundation is bad, then nothing else matters. Uh, and so it is important to understand the foundations. Understanding that this entire uh, uh, statement about the foundations is an analogy for life itself. Now, our national foundations are crumbling. Now, I don't just mean the Judeo-Christian ethic that used to dominate uh, the Western culture. Uh, for many years, uh, the Judeo-Christian worldview was pretty much the worldview of the West, uh, the worldview in particular of America, of the United States. 
But uh, over time, uh, the United States and the West in general has become more pagan, less Christian. So it's not only that we have forsaken the Judeo-Christian principles, but now we are forsaking common sense itself. We are forsaking workability. We are uh, forsaking logic. Uh, We are even forsaking pragmatism. And for all the things that can be said about pragmatism, at least there's an attempt to find out what works and put it into play. Now it is madness what is going on. So the foundations are crumbling. Uh, We're going to that from that which used to work to that which doesn't work. For that which was profitable to that which is, uh, is wasting. So let's understand this. Christians, your citizenship is first of all in heaven. Now, I'm proud to be an American citizen. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the red, white, and blue. But more than that, I am a citizen of heaven. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we ought to understand that. Uh, if you notice, we have uh, flags up. We have one that is the nation symbol. We have that here. Uh, but we also have a, a flag that's generally accepted to be uh, the symbol or the flag representing the faith of Christ, the faith of Christianity. Uh, we have that flag on the right And the reason we have it on the right is because all of flag protocol, if you read it, says that on the platform, the place to the right of the podium is the place of honor. And so that's where we put the Christian flag. Every now and then I have perhaps someone who is in the Boy Scouts or a military person say, your flags are wrong. The American flag is supposed to be in the place of prominence. And I just kind of smile. And I say, sir, what you're telling me is there is such a thing as a place of prominence. And they say, yes. And I said, well, guess which flag in church goes there? And that pretty well settles it, you know. Now, here's what I believe. We are, in a way, very much like David was, where we have an anointing, we have a history, we have a prophecy that sits upon us, but right now we're dealing with the realities of being with Saul. Now, think about how tough a job David had. Okay, he's a teenage boy. Uh, Samuel anoints him to be king, and so he's thinking, I'm going to be king. But when? I mean, years go by. Well, finally, he has a chance to prove himself on the field of battle, and he he slays Goliath. Uh, The Holy Spirit of God helps him take out a major enemy and a blasphemer, and, and a great battle ensues, and they win. And David's a national hero. The women come out singing, Saul is slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands. And I bet David wishes they had never sung that song because from that point on, Saul looked at David with a jaundiced eye. And so uh, he called David to come and play uh, the harp for him when Saul went through his fits and he went through his times when he wasn't right in his mind. And so they said, we know someone who can really play well on an instrument. And so they got David. So now uh, David is a soldier, but now he's also a a harp player. Uh, and, And so he's playing the harp for Saul. And Saul's over there on his throne, all morose and mad and frumpy and jealous. And he looks over there at David. And David's this young, powerful hero, nice-looking guy. Everybody loves him. He can really play the harp, too. And he's got this javelin in his hand. And he keeps fingering this javelin and looking at David. Now, I don't know if David had a music stand or not. I don't know if he had to have music, but I tell you what, he kept one eye on Saul. Because he'd be playing his harp, and Saul would be fingering that javelin, looking at David. Pretty soon he'd pick it up and throw it at him. And David was light of foot enough to move aside and land in the wall. And he'd say, well, I think I'm through playing the harp for today. And he'd go away. That was how David was dealing. And not only that, but there were times when David did have to hide. He did have to go or he'd be dead. Well, we see this now as a point where they're telling David, flee, flee. He he doesn't want to flee. He he thinks he ought to stand his ground. Uh, And so there is this thing that's going on where he's dealing with the realities where he's supposed to be king, but he's not. And there's a man who's nuts, who's mad, who's who's ruining the nation, and, and yet he's still in power. And why did God let this happen? Uh, You know, uh, when I read the Bible, I sometimes ask the why questions. Now, God hardly ever answers the why questions, but sometimes I ask them anyway. Why didn't God just let David be king early? Why didn't God just take Saul out and put David in where he could early be king? 
Well, there was a time when David had to find a band of soldiers to, to work with him and help him. And listen, when Saul was chasing David around, that's when David had his mighty 30 with him, his personal guard. And they went through many experiences together, hardships and difficulties and trials. And they bonded like few soldiers had ever bonded. One time David was thirsty and he was behind the lines and he just said, boy, I'd sure like a drink of water from the well in Jerusalem. I mean, in Bethlehem, rather. That was his hometown. He said, I'd sure like to taste that water from that well in Bethlehem. And uh, three of his men broke through the ranks and uh, at the risk of their own lives and they went and drew some water and they, they fought their way back through the Philistines and brought it back to David. And, and, and David said, I can't drink this water. It's like be drinking the blood of these brave men who risked their lives and he poured it out before the Lord. Now, li listen, God let David go through all of that to teach him how to grow, to teach him how to be a man and to bring men with him who would bond with him so that he could be the great warrior king that God would have him to be. So God knew the right timing. And listen, God knows the right timing with us too. So let's settle that. God's timing is right. We're being run by the madman. We're plucking our harp while we're looking at the world with one eye wondering when they're going to throw a javelin through us. That's kind of what's going on. So let's look at this and let's break it down and let's exegete this passage of Scripture. Now, we first of all have the attempt at marginalization. The attempt at marginalization. And what they do is they say, uh, you should flee. You should get away. You should hide. You should leave your post. You should leave your position. You should make yourself absent from society. You should go and hide now, that is to marginalize David. Uh, I believe that uh, these workers uh, of evil were planning against him, and so maybe it was his friends who were telling him to run and hide, or maybe it was people that, uh, it, it were people that didn't like him and didn't want him to be around. Either way, hiding is hiding. And so there was this attempt to marginalize him. Now, whether the warning was from friend or foe, David's answer was the same. He was determined to be who he was and remain where he was. Now, understand this. David sometimes did have to flee to preserve his own life. But when he could do so, he stayed right where he was and accepted the danger. So he would determine to be who he was and to be where he was. So there was the attempt at marginalization to just get David to hide. Now, in our culture today, there are attempts and there are very strong, aggressive attempts to cause Christians to become marginalized. The world doesn't mind if you believe the Bible as long as you don't really believe it. The world doesn't mind if you follow the teachings of Scripture as long as you don't really believe they matter. The world doesn't mind if you say what the Scriptures say as long as it con doesn't contradict what they say. And if it contradicts what they say, they don't want to hear it. They want you to stay behind your walls, not be in the city square, not be on the uh, public arena, not uh, engage in the arena of ideas. You just be quiet and enjoy your little Jesus thing while we run the world. And that's what the world wants today. In other words, hide. You hide. If you're a Christian, you're, you hide. You have to remain uh, in the background. You have to remain on the margin of societies. Uh, you do not have a place of prominence. Uh, your Judeo-Christian ethic is tired and worn out and old. We've rejected it, and we don't want to hear it. And so that's what's going on today. There are those that insist that people of faith should not involve themselves in the arena of ideas or the political process. They want us to go away and hide. And some people use the entire separation of church and state uh, concept to mean uh, that the state has authority over the church. Well, let's understand something today. The church does not have authority over the state, but we are guaranteed by God and by natural law and by our own constitution to have influence in the state. We get to speak. The freedom of speech is the freedom for Christians to speak. The freedom to speak is the, Christ, is the, uh, the freedom for you to speak. And listen, if the, only thing, if the only thing you're allowed to speak is to parrot the party line, then you don't have freedom of speech. 
Freedom of speech includes speech that they don't want to hear. And so we are told to be marginalized. Now, you know what we find over the decades now? That we are not supposed to offend anyone. We're not supposed to say anything's wrong. We're not supposed to say anything is sinful. We're not supposed to say anything that the world says is good. We're not supposed to call it bad. But you know, there's one group in our society today that you can lie about, that you can slander, that you can bully, that you can insult, that you can defame, and that's Bible-believing Christians. You can say anything you want about Christians, and the world is fine with it, and yet uh, we are supposed to be so polite. So we are being marginalized. If you are in a government job, or if you are in the educational program, or if you're in, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the arts or anything like that, and you let your Christian light shine, you're going to find out how quickly they want you to be marginalized. And that's what's going on. So there was the attempt at marginalization, but then there was also the conspiracy toward neutralization. Now, we could say that they wanted to kill him outright. Now, notice what, what it happened. We look at verse 2. Okay, for lo, for lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. So now it's getting violent. Now, in David's time, these arrows were not metaphorical. These arrows were real. Uh, there were those who were thinking, if I could just get a shot at him, if I could just find a way to privately get a hold and I could just shoot at David, uh, they would do so. And his life was threatened. He was in danger. And so these arrows for, her, for him were real. But now let's talk about also the metaphoric aim, uh, arrows that are aimed at us. There are those who have the desire uh, to cause the church to be more like the world. They want the church to reflect the values of this lost world. They want the church to be woke. They want the church to be liberal. They want the church to be leftist. They want the church to parrot the po political views of a certain party. Well, here's what I believe with all my heart. What political party are you a part of, uh, Pastor? What would you say? Here, here's where my politics has evolved. I'm going to support the party that's least likely to put Christians in jail. That's where I'm come to now. That's where I'm looking now. The political party that's least likely to find an excuse to round up Christians and put them in jail, that's where I'm going. Why? Because that's the party that's going to give us a little bit more time to serve Jesus Christ. And it won't be hard to figure out which that party is. So there you have it. Now, so there is the conspiracy toward neutralization of David. His enemies had gotten together in secret to work out a hidden plan to do him in. And uh, they were going to make David look bad by making him flee. And to paint him as someone who is a coward, who would run away. And so, here we see this as a type of Christ. The anointed king is a persecuted king. Now, they didn't shoot arrows at Jesus, but they did shoot arrows of slander. They did shoot arrows of false accusation. Uh, and they did try to defame him and defy him at every point that he could. Just as David was the hope for Israel's future, Christ is the hope for, for Israel and for the world's future, and yet they plotted against him and rejected him. They were ultimately successful, and Christ was rejected, but here's what happened. Jesus rose from the dead. And just as David eventually did sit on the throne, Jesus will eventually sit on the throne as well. The madman Satan is ruling for a short time yet. And he, things will get worse before they get better. But then they're going to get a great deal better. So there's the attempt at marginalization. Then there's the conspiracy toward neutralization of David. And then there is the resolution of David. And I love this part about him. We see David's heart. He says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Uh, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try. So let's break that down into its various parts. What does it mean in this resolution? Well, first of all, let's look at this. Uh, let's look at where the Lord sits. Where does the Lord sit? A lawn chair? Porch swing? No, the Lord sits on a throne. A throne is a place of power. It's a place of authority. So he says, the Lord is still on his throne. Now listen, Saul may be sitting on the throne of Israel, 
But in reality, the Lord God is still sitting on the throne of heaven. And so it is only by God's permission that Saul rules and only for a reason that God has. And so where the Lord sits, the Lord is still on his throne. And then what the Lord sees. Well, the Lord sees everything. He sees you. He sees me. He sees them. He sees what's going on. Uh, Notice it says uh, that his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. God is watching all the time. Have you ever thought about that? That every bad thing that somebody thinks they got away with, they didn't. Every court case that should have gone one way and went the wrong way, God knows about that too. Every person who did something in secret, God sees it in open. There's no secrets from God. Every injustice, He knows about it. Every wrong, He knows about it. Listen, I I know there are people today, maybe under the sound of my voice, And at some time or another in your life, somebody hurts you badly. Somebody did something very wrong to you. It may have been physical. It may have been emotional. It may have been financial. It may have been social. But in some way, someone injured you. And listen, they got away with it. They were never punished. They they seemed to be just scot-free. Well, listen, I I want to assure you something that God saw it. God saw it, and He is on it, and He is not going to let it go. God sees, he knows, he tries. And so David is talking about where the Lord sits and he's talking about what the Lord sees. And then he says, what the Lord sends, what the Lord sends. And and notice what he sends, what he sends them. He he said, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. So the Lord is trying, he's looking, he's seeing, and the righteous, what does the Bible say? He tries them. Now, David was going through trials. Do you realize today that every person that God called for service, He put them through trials first? And even while they were serving, they went through trials? You look through the Bible. You won't find anybody that God used that He didn't put them through a trial. His own Son, Jesus Christ, went through trials. So if you are going to follow Christ, listen, if you're going to follow Christ, you can count on it, you're going to go through trials. He is going to build your faith that way. So that's that's what God does for the righteous. But what does He do about the wicked? Notice, upon the wicked He shall rain snares and fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. Now, you read through the Psalms. David sometimes would be, he would get real. He would get real with God about how he feels about his enemies. Listen, his enemies were coming into the area of Israel. They were killing men and women. They were raping. They were plundering. They were doing terrible, wicked things. And and, and sometimes David would pray to God. He said, God, get them. Get them, God. Hit them with a lightning bolt. Hit them in the mouth. Uh, break their teeth. Uh, David would, would want, he would want to make God this avenging hero if you would just come down and give them what for. David is praying. They call them, uh, there's a name, the precatory psalms. Now that's a fancy word for the angry psalms, the vengeance psalms. David wants God to get them. Now here is David saying, the Lord's going to get them. He's going to get the enemies. He's going to take care of business. He'll rain fire and snares and brimstone and a horrible tempest. That will be their cup. So that's what the Lord sends to those who are unrighteous. Now, so we come to the question in his resolution, what can the righteous do? What can the righteous do? Now, whether it was his uh, advisors who asked the question, or whether it was David and his pondering asked the question, here's the point. It's a good question, isn't it? What does it mean the foundations are destroyed? Well, think about it. David's world was crumbling. I mean, there's supposed to be justice. There's supposed to be, if you do something good, you get rewarded. If you do something bad, you get punished. And yet David was doing something good and getting punished. And there were people that were doing bad and they were rewarded. So that's a crumbling right there. The foundations of society depend on justice and justness. You think about a deteriorating culture. It shows up in the family. 
It shows up in the arts. It shows up in culture. It shows up in the economy. It shows up in national identity. It shows up in the media. It shows up in entertainment. As a society degenerates, you're able to see the foundations are being destroyed. And what you used to be able to count on, you can't count on it anymore. And so, how do you live? What do you do when things are coming apart? It's a good question. It's a philosophical question that has a good answer. And I love the fact that anywhere in the Bible, a real heavy question like that is asked, a real great answer is given. So we're going to get into the answer. What can the righteous do? Well, first of all, stand in your place. Stay put. David wasn't inclined to leave. He wasn't inclined to go. Sometimes, listen, sometimes you have to run. But most of the time, what we need is resolve to stay put. So David was dependent, he was determined to be where he was and to be who he was. Do you know where your place is in life? Do you know what role you have to play? Do you know who God wants you to be? Where has he placed you? What has he gifted you with? What opportunities has he put in your path? What, what uh, areas of expertise do you have? God has given you a life. And your life has value. Your life has purpose. It means something your life does. Do you know what it is? Well, stay there. Be you. Don't be someone else. You be you. Why? Because you're the only you that can be you. God wants you to be where you are. Don't waver in knowing and professing the truth. And church, let, let's just remember something. When the world gets mixed up and the world gets dizzy and the world is falling down, they're going to look somewhere for truth. They're going to look somewhere for, for stability. They're going to look somewhere for logic and common sense and what works. And guess what? The church of Jesus Christ will be right there believing what we've always believed and speaking what we've always known to be true all this time. Let's don't change the truths of God to make the world like us. We're not supposed to make the message likable. We're supposed to make the message available. Listen, if I go to the doctor, here's what I want. I want a doctor who will lie to me and make me feel good and deny me the cure so I can die with him as my big pal. Is that right? Do I go to the doctor and say, listen, doc, I'll even pay you more if when you find something wrong with me, you just be your little secret and you don't tell me about it. I'll pay you even more if there's a cure for my disease that I won't like the taste of it or I won't like it. and you, I'd, I'd just rather die than for you to tell me what's really wrong with me. No, none of us do that way with our doctor. Listen, when we go to the doctor, we're not interested in his feelings. We're interested in a diagnosis. What is the truth? What is wrong with me? And when he tells us, you know what we do? We pay him for telling us the truth. But then people go to church and they have a different idea. I don't like that preacher. He rubs me the wrong way. Well, if, if listen, if, if, if he's rubbing the fur the wrong way, then turn around. Turn around. Listen, the truth is the truth. I didn't make it up. Listen, preachers don't go home and say, oh, what kind of irritating thing can I say this Sunday? Preachers don't go home and say, well, how can I be uh, abrasive? How can I be harsh? How can I make me have less friends and, and, and less people love me? No, no. We, we read the Bible and we find what God says and we are told and commanded by God to preach the Word and to do it with long-suffering and with, with doctrine and correction. Why? Because that's what edifies us. Listen, I have to stand before the Lord God Almighty one day for how I treat His Word and how I speak the truth. And so what we are to do is to stand in our place. Listen, the church still knows what's right and what's wrong. The church still knows what's good and what's bad. The church still knows what's righteous and what's unrighteous. Listen, the church still knows what a woman is. Amen? The church still knows things that everybody used to know and now are changing on. So stand in your place. Number two, trust in the Lord. David recounted a number of truths that assured him of God's love, his righteousness and his power and his grace. These truths were what kept him in the arena of service, even in the face of opposition and peril. So one, stand in your place. Two, 
trust in the Lord. And three, and here it is, be assured of ultimate victory. Now listen, I'm sure there were times when David just wanted to quit. He said, I'm done with this military life. I think I'll go back to being a shepherd again. It was a lot more peaceful. Maybe David just wanted to quit. But you know, there's something he remembered, and he talked about it in one of his psalms. He remembered the oil on his head. He remembered how the fragrant oil that was used to anoint him went down on his face and onto his beard and dripped onto his garments. He remembered that. I was anointed. I was set apart. I was commissioned to be king. And he knew that this was from God. He knew that this was his destiny. And all the while, while he was hiding from Saul, all the while, while he was trying to just stay alive, he knew one day I'm going to sit on the throne. What kind of king will I be? You know, it's so interesting to me when, when, listen, there were a couple of times when David had an opportunity to take Saul out. He was alone in a cave one time. (laughs) And David was already in the cave. So Saul goes into the cave. And David's already in there. So here comes Saul, and he lays down to take a rest, and David's in the cave, and one of his men said, you can get him now. You can take him out. David says, no, and he says, well, then let me do it. David says, no, I'll not touch God's anointed. If he goes, it's because God takes him, not me. Listen, his men heard him say that. His men watched his behavior. He was not an opportunist. uh, He was not one to take matters into his own hands. He was going to let God be the one to take Saul out. And here's how we see David's heart. When finally Saul was taken in battle along with his son Jonathan, David wept for Saul as if he were his own father. And he wrote a beautiful poem, a song about them. And he he caused everybody to sing it uh, to uh, recognize their heroism. David was a man. He was a man of God, and he stayed in his place, but he was assured of ultimate victory. All my problems, all my worries, all my fears are temporary. And may I apply that to us today? All of our worries, all of our fears, all of our troubles, listen, are temporary. We are are guaranteed by God to rule and reign with him a thousand years. And so be assured of ultimate victory victory. I want to draw our attention to a wonderful passage of Scripture, 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Here's what the Bible tells us about this, how it's all going. 1 John 5, verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Do you see that? Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Listen, we're in a mess. We are in a mess. The foundations are crumbling. What are the righteous going to do? Well, I'll tell you one thing. The only thing that really matters is your faith in Jesus Christ. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are made righteous by His blood, and what you will do is stand your ground, be who you are, and be that where you are, and keep on being that till He comes and sets up His kingdom. Until then, we may be accounted sheep for the slaughter. Until then, we may be pushed around a bit. But listen, let's be what God called us to be. There's a hymn called, How Firm a Foundation. I want to just quote a few uh, verses of that. Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all-sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume, and thy gold to refine. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to trust you. Lord, help us to lean on you in the times in which we live. Help us to be strong. Lord, help us to, Lord, not only be a witness, but Lord, to be a witness of the joy of the Lord. Because while we are caused by some to be afraid, we will choose not to be afraid. 
While we are encouraged by others to hide ourselves, we will not hide. We will stand and we will have smiles on our faces and love in our hearts. And we will fellowship with you and with one another. And Lord, our witness to the world will be consistent and as gracious as we can make it and also as truthful as we can be. Oh, Father, I pray that you would use your church to bring about a change in the West, a change in this culture. Lord, (coughs) because the foundations need to be rebuilt. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that has yet to make life's most important decision, Lord, that he or she would just quietly and and yet sincerely pray and ask Jesus Christ to save their souls and to trust his resurrection, to trust his uh, sacrifice on their behalf and on the cross. And Lord, to accept him as Lord and Savior and be willing to listen to his voice and to follow him in this world. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.